participation ethics are the subject of my talk today. And this involves not only what we should restore, but also what standards we should follow. Does anyone here happen to know the earliest written reference to restoration of buildings? Could anyone want to guess? No guesses. Well, believe it or not, it comes from the Old Testament, Isaiah 58, verse 12. And it reads as follows. And ye shall rebuild ancient ruins, restoring old foundations. And ye shall be known as the rebuilder of broken walls and the restorer of dwelling places. Clearly, that biblical text directs us to restore and rebuild. What it doesn't say is what standards we should follow. These are certainly not addressed in the Old Testament. But before we talk about standards, we really have to talk about what the words mean that we use in preservation today. We use words like restore, reconstruct, rebuild, rehabilitate, renew, repair, renovate, reuse, on and on and on and on till you're out of R's and then you start some other words. But the point is that they all sound so similar and yet they're all very different and the terms are often confused. Let's look at four key preservation terms. We have the first slide please. By restore, I like to refer to museum quality restorations. Preserving buildings or parts of buildings by carefully repairing or just cleaning original materials. Taking something and just putting it back together as if it were new. Preserving their original appearance with as little as possible new materials. All the existing fabric at your, at your disposal must be reused. I show you two restorations. One, a little tiny finial from the top of a gatepost, which you just saw. And here, two complete restorations. One for a commercial hotel in Wilmington, Delaware, this Hotel DuPont, and this room looking exactly like it did in 1910 and the other in the City Hall of Philadelphia, the center of the hall, this great room, Conversation Hall, which now looks exactly like it did when it was first done in 1895. By reconstruction, another term, we mean to remake all or part of a building that is missing or too far gone to save and repair but always to make it in the form, material, color, and pattern to match the original. So if you have something that's too far gone and you have to reconstruct it, you can do like we did on the right, all the way at the far right. You can make it simply in stone again, reconstruct it as this finial from the top of this neo-Gothic church. Or the next slide, you can make it in fiberglass to remake those capitals which are on this uh, front of this brownstone building, also uh, made out of fiberglass, both of those new replicas. The third term, rehabilitation. Here we mean to make useful again. In most cases, not necessarily in any form similar to the original to the original appearance or even the original use. So for example, what the next slide shows, this magic trick that's shown here. Everybody thought that rehabilitation was this wonderful trick to take this old building and if you do it as a rehabilitation without any concern for the historic material, voila, you turn it into this wonderful new configuration. At best, on the other hand, if we did the same thing, we might get back, for example, to that. 
And so the trick would be to begin with the old building, completely renew it in a rehabilitated form, and come back and look like something that it did to begin with. So there are two sides to the coin of rehabilitation. The fourth key phrase is intervention. These are new additions or insertions into existing buildings which are added to solve current problems or fulfill current needs. At worst, and here is a worst case, they can be absolutely outrageous and glaring. The need was to build this little restaurant entrance into an, an existing bank building in Cincinnati, and look what they did, right in the middle of the Fourth National Bank. At best, of course, you don't have to be outrageous and glaring. At best, they can be restrained and almost invisible. In this wonderful Victorian house, in this library inside, there are two interventions that are shown here in the, in the room. One is the down lights in the ceiling, not quite outrageous, but somewhat. But the other is the main lighting for the room, and it might even be difficult for you to find now even that I've told you about it. The main lighting for the room is not the chandelier. The main lighting is in the tops of those cornices on the bookcases. All the lighting is directed up. It is, in, it is a fluorescent light, indirect from the ceiling and facing down. That kind of intervention is absolutely minimal. Well, in the field of historic preservation, in which many times involves restoration, reconstruction, rehabilitation, and intervention, all four, it is in this field of historic preservation that ethics come into play. For it is the preservation of historic buildings in which professional standards of conduct determine that what we do today, how that will affect something for years to come, if not for centuries to come. Now let's talk about some standards, and if we can turn off the slides for a moment, we'll do that. Standards. A preservation architect, just by the title, must respect the building on which he is working. Respect. He must be competent, based on both his training and his experience, and he must constantly aspire to the highest and most exacting standards possible. So, respect, absolute competence in what he's doing, and aspiration. These are the first standards we must have as preservation architects. The preservation architect must only use the most suitable and appropriate treatments. Whenever possible, select reversible treatments so that he is able to undo what he's done if that need occurs. We're all experimenting these days. And in order to know if you're right, you sometimes have to wait, wait 25 or 50 years. What if you do something wrong? You want to have the possibility of reversing what you did. So reversibility, another important standard. An architect, a preservation architect, must place strict limits on aesthetic reinterpretation. This is something that it's very difficult sometimes to do. But you must keep in check your natural instincts to improve or make better aesthetically the original building design because of current fashions or trends. The original building character and appearance must not be modified or reinterpreted based on fashions or trends or state of the art today. Now this is hardest to do, especially when the preservationist who's working on a building does not happen to like the original design. And this happens a lot. Because you don't like a Victorian building, you reinterpret its color, you reinterpret its pattern, and you reinvent history. And this is something you must avoid. 
The preservation architect must constantly keep up to date and educate himself about new materials and methods at his disposal so that, in fact, you must know not only what to do on one hand, but clearly on the other hand, what to avoid. And there's nothing more important than knowing what to avoid. The preservation architect must protect and preserve the works under his care. Who do you protect them against? You protect them against the workman who's sloppy, the workman who doesn't care that if he runs the conduit the wrong way, he's going to destroy an important segment of that building. You must be on guard against these people and protect your building from their influence. You must also protect it from the owner, the owner who's ambitious and who wants to maintain his building and who maintains it absolutely improperly by using the wrong materials and by so doing literally destroys his building every week that he goes through cleaning it because he absolutely uses the wrong materials. So you must constantly be on guard to protect and repair those buildings all through its life. And finally, a, a, a preservation architect has an obligation to his colleagues and to his profession to share the knowledge that he has gained with them, to train trainees, and to instill preser preservation techniques and preservation ethics with those trainees and also with the public at large. And by the way, public speaking and lectures are a good way to spread the ethic of preservation. Now there are some complaints and naysaying, and I'll get them out of the way early, and they have to do with the generalist architect. The architect who are involved these days in the largest number of preservation problems, the largest amount of preservation work, is probably the generalist architect today. And they do this work with little or no training or experience in restoring old buildings. The generalist architect tends to have no standards whatsoever and tends to use treatments that are absolutely inappropriate to the buildings. Generalist architects tend to impose their own aesthetic judgments onto the historic buildings on which they are working without any sense of responsibility, without any responsibility to the history of the building or to the future generations who will have to reinterpret that history and get a false impression of what was there originally. If they do follow any standards whatsoever, they are generally a forced standard, a standard by a government agency like the National Park Service, for example, which are often absolutely minimal standards. And it's important for everyone in this room to know that the National Park standards that this country follows and holds up as wonderful standards are absolutely minimal standards in the historic preservation field. Well, like any forced standard, they are generally avoided if no one's looking, they are generally overlooked, and they are generally shunted aside, and that's what's happening today in historic preservation. Generally, preservation architects do much too much work on buildings of historic nature. They do too much work because they find that it's easier. And certainly all the work they do does not have to be done. They could do less, and that's significant. They feel that the most expedient solutions are the best, and they're not. They also find that solutions which are universal seem good to them. If they work there, they'll work here. Absolutely not so. And most important, they don't realize that the smallest details in historic buildings are as important as the entire building. In the 1950s, architects of the Miesian philosophy coined the phrase, and we hear it all the time, less is more. In the 70s and 80s, 
good preservation architects follow faithfully that dictum, less is more. The less you do on your historic building, the better it is historically. In the 1950s, we also heard the phrase, God is in the details. In preservation architecture, that's absolutely the case. It, in fact, is this amalgamation of details that makes that building historic. And as you chip away and take away all the historic details, you tend, in fact, to have a shell, a former historic building, a building that has lost its integrity. That's a major problem. I would like to discuss some three separate examples, case studies, three separate projects which outline my ethical philosophy concerning the preservation of historic buildings. In each instance, the preservation uh, solutions were all very different. In each case, the type of building, its style, its original date of construction, and its importance, again, were all very different. However, they had one thing in common. All of the buildings were significant historically. They had some historical significance, whether it be at a local level or a national level, and therefore they were important buildings. In terms of a preservation or restoration philosophy, I'm going to discuss the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, which some of the students happened to visit. And I was able to guide them through, so they'll see some photographs of that. In terms of rehabilitation, I'm going to discuss a hotel project, also in Philadelphia, a high-rise hotel project, which was uh, rehabilitated under the Tax Act uh, works and following much more than the standard of the National Park Service, going much further in terms of standards than that. And finally, in terms of intervention, I'm going to talk about the National Gallery of Art in Washington, its new Oculus, which was opened about a year ago. I should note that in spite of the variety of the buildings I'm going to talk about and variety of their types, in spite of the variety of their solutions, all three projects followed the same approach. And I think this approach is important to historic buildings. First, careful analysis and research and documentation. That must be done. Because you must know everything possible about that historic building before you begin to touch one area of that building. This involves intensive historic research, accurate surveys and drawing documentation of the building, absolutely in detail. And before beginning any work, we want to know everything about that building. Two, a careful analysis and evaluation of all the material you now found, the current functional needs, and then you can begin to determine options of what is available to us in treating the building. In this phase, we do two things as part of the analysis. We first reconfirm that some kind of intervention is absolutely necessary. Sometimes you find, after you do this analysis, that you're wrong from the beginning. Don't touch the building. It's not necessary. You've just made a mistake. And so walk away from such projects. If you don't have to do it, don't do it. The next thing you have to do if you have to intervene into that building is to limit your intervention. And think about the philosophy of limitation of intervention so that you're picking the key areas which you must intervene in, and only those areas do you work in. You also study in this phase the reversibility of your proposed interventions. Thirdly, based on the understanding of the needs, based on the documentation, you must recognize, and this is key, recognize the limits of your own knowledge. We don't all know everything. 
We need able assistance and guidance from other consultants, from other experts, and there are things we don't know. And if you don't know it, don't do it. Historic buildings don't get a second chance. Call in a consultant. Look for assistance and advice. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. I'm going to get an expert. So recognize the limits of your knowledge. Then provide careful before, during, and after documentation in your work in the form of photographs, in the form of drawings, in the form of written reports. Record what you're doing because posterity will want to know. And not only record how you're doing it and what you're doing it, but if possible, record why you're doing it because that makes a big difference and understanding later on. How many times have I looked at historic buildings and said to myself, I see what they've done, I know what they've done, why did they do that? So leave the record. That is part of your obligation as good preservation architects. Finally, after you've gathered all this material, you completed the building, what do you do with it? Do you just let it die in your files and forget about it? You must find a permanent home for all that information you collected, all those hours you spent in documentation, you've got to put it someplace where people can get it. You can put it in archives and libraries. Sometimes the building itself has an archive or library, and they will want it for documentation. If they don't, find an archive that does, and after your stature of limitations is up, put it in that archive. And that's what we do in our projects. Now we're going to look at some case studies, beginning with the restoration of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And here it is in 1876 when it was first built. And there it is today, looking like, much like it did in 1876 following its restoration. This national landmark building houses the nation's oldest art museum and art school. Its collections of American paintings is world renowned and its school has produced great American artists over the last 180 years and has been most influential in American art. It is a relatively small building, as you can see from these slides, about 60,000 square feet of space. It's on a small lot right in the center of the city, right in the downtown heart of Philadelphia. It was designed in 1876 by a flamboyant Victorian architect named Frank Furness who was a man that was full of color and full of life. And when you see the inside, you'll see his personality in there. The respect for a building of this stature can be overwhelming. And the obligation to future generations, absolutely awesome, if not frightening. Our goal here was to authentically restore this building to its 1876 appearance in its public spaces while making the building technically up to date, a modern museum and a modern school in terms of its systems, mechanical and electrical, all throughout the building. Well, let's just take a look at that for the moment. When we first found the building, this is what it looked like. Many of the skylights had been closed. The building had never been cleaned inside. It had been painted many, many times, sometimes as much as 40 coats of paint on surfaces throughout the building. By careful analysis and documentation, we began to understand what happened to this building over the hundred years of its useful life. And little by little, we began to strip away the additions that were made and went back to the 1876 appearance. And here we're getting down to the basic bone structure of the building. We put away layer upon layer of paint and found under the paint that there were silver stars on a blue sky, for example, in the top of this whole main space. Gold and reds, Pompeian red and gold, came through when we began to scrape down layers of paint. Some of the original gold was still intact. 
but all of it was renewed. And so the main hall, after a very short time of restoration, with most of the elements still in place, became a wonderful array of red, white, and blue colors, very patriotic, because this building was opened right for the, for the centennial celebration in Philadelphia in 1876. And the architect was giving to Philadelphia and to the nation a wonderful patriotic image of American art in this building. We would find behind paintings like this, because of strange elements that you see below, that something was wrong. And we found that all the walls had been covered by a series of layers of plaster, of wood, of other coverings. And when we began to cut away those coverings, took off the painting and cut through a hole right behind that painting, we saw found rooms, found areas, completely intact from 80 or 90 years ago when they were completely sealed up. And so this is a space directly behind that painting. So little by little, the function, the arrangement of spaces began to be new throughout the entire building. Areas like this, if you look carefully, you say, my goodness, that's not the Frank Furness I saw as an architect. When I saw that main hall, something's wrong. Again, the cover-up occurred. It began in 1904 and occurred on and on until by the 1960s, the international style had tried to sweep away all the Victorian sumptuous color, all the Victorian sumptuous detail, and make it into a rather bland, plain, lifeless, white space. So we began to tear away these sections. And if you look behind there, which is that same column, you can see the first glimmers of the things we began to find some of which were thrown away when they covered it up, and some of which were left behind. And little by little, when we pulled all of this off, we began to see wonderful details with the gold still in place. All that had to be done was to clean it up. Other areas had been painted, other portions gone. These are all made of cast iron, polychromed and gilted. And here are the pieces that were missing. Initially made in cast iron, now we made them in lightweight fiberglass. The cost in cast iron today, about $2,000. The cost in fiberglass, about $180. The difference in weight, the difference in attachment makes this a much easier way to put things back together, save a lot of money, so we did do it in fiberglass. And now look at the difference, the same space. All the color brought back by careful paint analysis, all the materials put back together, and now the polychromy, the richness of that space, all back at the academy after an absence of maybe 60 or 70 years. And this is how we begin to return the building to the splendor of that period. The wonderful attic space that was given to us in 1876 by the original architect. It was a very functional space. In fact, the exterior skylight at the roof level kept the rain out. The interior skylight here in this space was a layer of insulation. That is, air insulation. When the sun came through, the air in this middle layer would warm and get hot and they would draw off this hot air constantly, not letting that hot air go down to the galleries below. The idea was to reuse this system, and that's what we did. When we had to put ducts and air conditioning in, we used the same system. We tried to capture the hot air or the cold air in this insulating layer before it got to the major galleries. As you can see, the duct's work was put up there. You can see it above the skylight. You see how it was located here. All the duct work came and fed around the perimeter of each skylight around each room. And the duct work fed to all that ornamentation, that open ornamentation around the edge of the skylight. So there were no grills to be seen, no return air louvers. All the air came and went 
in the same louver system that Frank Furness used. Therefore, there was no intrusive new mechanical system to be seen. And here you can see it finalized with all the skylight put back in place. And that was really a very helpful way to use the mechanical system. By removing paint coatings, this is the way the doors looked initially. About 12 or 14 coats of paint easily on one door, some as many as 40 as I said. Underneath of it all was natural oak in a beautiful condition, protected over the last century by all these layers of paint. And if you look where the hardware is in the door, it was filled in with plaster and covered over. But all the hardware was still there, as you can see. And when we opened it up and cleaned it all out and repolished the existing hardware, we had all the hardware as if it was new. And not one piece of hardware in about 60 doors had to be replaced. It was all there. When a repair had to be made to a piece of wood, even though it would be finished, generally in paint, the workmen were very careful to try to put matching pieces of wood, not only the same species, but the same type of grain treatment back in place. So when they put into place a Dutchman like this, the care that was taken was a reverence for the building. And it's this kind of reverence which makes this kind of restoration an important restoration. When you had to add modern conveniences to the building, such as security telephones, lighting, temperature controls, humidity controls, thermostats, thermographs, they're all encased in the existing material in a way that normally you don't see it. So when this is closed, that's what it looks like, and only the people who know that it exists know where it is. This allows all the modern, up-to-date conveniences of a modern museum to be included in this restoration, but not to take away from the original appearance of the building. Well, we remade every kind of molding that was available. Sometimes they were wooden, wood molding, sometimes they were metal molding, sometimes they were plaster molding, sometimes they were special grate conditions or paneling all of which can be made today just like they were made in the 19th century. We have the availability of all the materials, we have the availability of almost all the skills, and it's incredible how people enjoy doing these things once again. The workmen love to be challenged at things like this, and they constantly rise to the bait, and they constantly do a good job if they're interested. In terms of preservation of the main stairway, the brasswork was restored, the railings were restored, and the railings themselves, for example, became conduit locations for the electrical work. The conduit was run underneath that wood balustrade, underneath that wood banister, into the plinth blocks so they could feed these once gas lamps with electricity now. And all of these lanterns all along the stairways are now lit with electricity and are really quite up to date. We added, of course, things like elevators. These are brand new. They were never there before. And so they had to be added in a way that would be fitting uh, the original building. This elevator happens to be added outside the original construction. The only thing we had to do was cut this one opening for it at this level. This was a wonderful thing that we had to do. We found a section of original mitten and caustic tile. This hasn't been made since the 1920s. It was made in England originally. It was brought from England for this building. And here it is complete. And this year, we really finished the restoration of this building by putting down a whole floor of mitten tile. This tile was made all by hand following the exact process that was used in the 19th century when it was first invented. It was made in England by the very same manufacturers who made this material in 1876 for this building. So this intricate pattern was a very important addition to the building. But we have to keep the building up to date. It has to become modern, it has to meet code, and all historic buildings really should meet code because they not only protect themselves that way, 
but they protect their contents and all the people who use them. Here we're putting in fire hose cabinets. Yes, we have to destroy something that's irreversible, but when it's all put back, we haven't lost that much, and the building becomes that much safer. We found some interesting things when we did our digging and investigation. Walls that had been added, this one on the 45 degree angle, we cut out behind that and found the original fabrics for the building. And by looking carefully at the documentation and the board's minutes, for each year we found when each fabric was added. This one at the very top of the pile was added in 1910, the one below in 1890, and the one below the red fabric, the very original fabric from 1876, really in quite pristine color because it had been protected for so long under all these other layers, gave us our chance to remake the material exactly as it appeared in 1876, following the same weaving methods, following the same materials, and following the same colors. And so that was all put up again. The art museum also is part of a larger whole. There's an art school. And you can see what's happened to a major corridor in the art school over time. It just became a locker room. We really wanted to bring back the spirit of the restoration to the art school. So we took the lockers out, relocated them in the building, and then opened up that corridor to use as it was originally for a series of sculptures. So that all during the day, the students are able to sketch using these sculptures as their models. And they are a very important part of the Academy's heritage. These models, many of them came as early as 1820 to the Academy. And therefore, here was a place to show them and to use them exactly as they were used earlier. Studio spaces became renewed and relived. Here they are, again, the students using models just as they had done in the 19th century. The curriculum is almost identical. There's been very few changes. And the space is now up to date and modern and safe for them to use again. Well, the Academy was a project which took about two years to complete. And it was reopened on April 22, 1976 for the bicentennial in Philadelphia. And it opened exactly 100 years to the day and hour of its original opening in 1876. And as I always tell everybody, I remember coming up the main stairs of the academy. I was the first person in the building. And I saw all these workmen sweeping out, going out the back. Luckily, no one was there ahead of me, but I was the only one to see that. But it did open on time. And clearly, this is an authentic museum quality restoration that involved reconstruction in several areas, certainly intervention with new systems such as electrical lighting and air conditioning, and certainly the addition of some new areas such as a museum shop, kitchens, and new school facilities which really were never there in 1876. This building now meets or exceeds the most stringent life safety codes, and therefore we feel the building is a safe building. On the other hand, if Frank Furness, the original architect, was to return and see the reopening in, 18, in 1976, we believe that without any effort on his part, he would clearly recognize his work and find himself quite at home in the restored academy uh, building. The building, by the way, was restored with about 90% of its original fabric intact. Some, of course, was lost long before we began our restoration. And some original fabric, in fact, had to be lost even during our restoration. The next project we want to talk about, and here's two more pictures of the Academy, is the Bellevue Stratford. This is a historic rehabilitation project. This is not like the Academy of Fine Arts, a national landmark. However, it is on the National Register of Historic Places and is considered in Philadelphia to be one of the 100 most important and significant buildings in Philadelphia. And this is not just due to its architecture, which is certainly interesting, but also to the social context 
because the history of this building socially as the center of Philadelphia cultural and social institutions is absolutely paramount in Philadelphia's history. It was built in 1904 in the French Renaissance Revival style. It was considered in 1904 a super modern hotel. Those are a direct quotes from newspaper clippings. It was super modern in its style, this French Renaissance Revival, as well as in function. For example, every one of its thousand guest rooms had its own bathroom, absolutely extraordinary in 1904. And there were over a thousand telephones in this building, most modern. And in fact, it had electric lighting, which was designed by Thomas Edison. And its power for the entire building, including 14 elevators going 22 stories, was generated by its own basement coal-fired power plant. It was often compared in the days when it first opened to a ship at sea. Raw materials were brought into this building, but everything else was powered from the inside. It even had its own park at the top of the building so that you could have your recreation in this building, be entertained at this building, have office work done in this building, sleep in this building, eat in this building, go to the library in this building, shop in this building. In fact, never step off this ship at sea for anything that was needed outside. Its water supply was even its own from its artesian wells in the basement. And so only mass foodstuffs brought in, everything cooked on the premises, everything baked on the premises. So it was a super modern building. The preservation intent was to strip away the myriad changes and modifications made to this hotel over the last 75 years and to recapture the sumptuous splendor of the 1904 appearance. The main public spaces of this building, the lobbies, corridors, and ballrooms, were all to be generally restored, and the guest rooms and secondary rooms were to be historically rehabilitated, and the service areas, including all bathrooms, kitchens, mechanical areas, were to be completely modernized. This certainly was a tax act project, but as I said before, we did not just follow the minimal standards of the National Park Service, we did much more. And we did much more because there was an enlightened owner who was truly interested in the, histori in the history of the building and who wanted to save that history. Let's take a look at some of the things that happened in this building. Here you can see some early documentation we found. Superior graphite paint gave us a hint to how the building was constructed and in what stages just by that ad. Early rendering of the building we found by the architects in one of the periodicals of the time. The ornamentation on the outside, generally intact and in pretty good condition. Terracotta ornament, as you can see here, and terracotta ornament made to look like limestone. In the bottom of the building, by the way, it was limestone. High enough so that by the time they changed to terracotta, you couldn't quite tell. And so after a year or two, it all looked like limestone, although most of it was terracotta. Modern building in terms of its heating plants and power plants, and of course its huge kitchens, which could easily serve at one setting 5,000 people in 1904. The building had undergone gone a lot of changes, and here's what it looked like when we came. And again, the international style had pervaded this hotel. In the 1940s, in the 1950s, this hotel's main competition was the modern motel. And in order to compete, this hotel felt it must look like a modern motel. And so all the public areas were changed to look like that 1950s style. Slick materials, glass, polished granite, stainless steel. These were the materials that replaced the rich interiors of this building. We stripped them away, getting back to the original construction, and then reconstructed the building to look like it did in 1904, including the front entrance here. Windows, for example, if you look at the very top of those windows and those transom panels, they were covered in plywood and painted. 
When we took the plywood off, we found that there were painted surfaces underneath. When we removed the paint, we found all the stained glass still intact. All we had to do was clean it, relight it, and these became ornaments to the street once again, just as they had in 1904. The main lobby had been cut up. Look at what happened to the elevators. Any public space, any public areas, the most front areas were changed to black marble, stainless steel, heavy, shiny materials to look like it was modern and up to date. All of this had to be taken back to the original feeling of the 1904 design. Intrusions. Throughout the entire lobby, there were now two places you could sit when we first got there, all in filled with airline uh, offices, rental car offices, all kinds of infill of jewelry stores and small shops, none of which related to the open lobby areas that were there in 1904. And even before the furniture was set in place, when it first opened, the whole ambiance came back because it was not just detail, it was not just design, but it was open space that was part of the original design considerations of a hotel of this character. Cleaning the marble. Never done in 75 years. Careful treatments and testing had to be done before we would finally even test it on the marble itself. We had to do these tests and finally choose the right type of material carefully because a mistake in terms of cleaning could destroy the color and figure of that existing marble. Plaster restorations were of main concern all of which could be restored and were restored by people who hadn't done it for a while, but again were interested in regaining those skills and redoing these wonderful designs. So you might take an area like this where we took air conditioning equipment out, which was put in the 1950s, and able to return it to part of the major lobby space as part of the restoration. The main wall area directly opposite the elevator held the international clock. All had been cut with holes into the marble work to run conduits and pipes in the 1950s, also in the 1930s, and we couldn't match the marble. It's impossible to match figures like this again with new marble. You either had to take out all the marble and put in new, or fill in the way we did here, keeping all of the existing material and filling in those holes with painted surfaces to match the existing figure in terms of color. So what you see there is a third of the wall in paint, but all of the original marble still intact. Can we make ornamental plaster the way they did? Absolutely. All portions of it. We made column bases and we made these wonderful figurine heads. Using one sample that we found, we were able to reconstruct an entire room, all done exactly the same way as it was done during the turn of the century. Mycenaean Marble Company, no longer in existence, then they made wonderful artificial marble. And we found one of the last people who had worked for the Mycenaean Marble Company. And here he is, and we brought him out of retirement, and he was delighted to come back and help us restore these 20 columns in the main lobby of the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. And he was delighted to show young people and train them on how to do this work. And now they're doing it, these young people are doing it, all over the eastern seaboard. Because there are other companies that are no longer in business that need to have this kind of work done. Well, the restoration uh, was completed and we opened a little late for this project. It was supposed to open on its 75th birthday, but you know how things are in construction work. We opened 75 years and one day after its original opening. So that was pretty good. Again, a great deal was preserved in this government certified rehabilitation project. And the reuse of the existing materials was specified whenever possible. About 80% of the original material remains in the building. In the ballroom or in its other function rooms like the Burgundy Room, major restorations occurred because these were the rooms where the public 
would most likely be able to see the feeling of the richness of those spaces and enjoy those parties again because of the richness of these spaces. Stairways, major stairways running through the building were saved. And because of some creative techniques in code conformance, we were able to save completely open stairways, which were 20 stories high, opening at every floor, so that these could become ornaments to every floor and enjoyed by everyone who was there. This stairway was designed by the architect originally. He was given the commission by the owner who said, Mr. Hewitt, who was the original architect, designed for me a stairway for promenading of ladies. And that's the design that he came up with. The Bellevue Stratford is an E plan, as you can see here. And there were many, many small rooms. Many times we would put two rooms together, taking away this middle partition, making that one entire room. Bathrooms were completely modernized, as I told you. As you can see here, all the fixtures were removed in 1930. And then again in 1955 and 52, they were renewed once again. In fact, we found four pink bathrooms from the 1950, which we were hard pressed to tear out. But all the, all the uh, bathrooms were changed to modern bathrooms using fine materials that really matched the elegance of the rest of the building, marbles like this. The rooms that we talked about, here you can see how we did it. We took out a center wall right there. And we opened up the room. And you can see we made a sleeping area and a living area. Much larger rooms, much more sumptuous rooms. Rooms that meet the standards of today. But let me say that when we took out this partition, we just didn't throw it away. It didn't become a demolition problem. All the materials that made up that wall were reused. We saved all the baseboards. We saved all the doors that were in that wall. We saved all the trim. And in fact, we mined, M-I-N-E-D, the building itself for its materials. Because where else could you get Honduras mahogany again to match what was there? And here they all are. As we tore this material out, it was stripped and cleaned. And then it was found useful again in making up new partitions and new doorways. And all the material was recycled. Here are some of the doors going back in place. They're made of Honduras mahogany. The cost of such a door would be about $1,500 today. And here we had all the doors that we needed for the new uses. So this mine of material was available to us at very little cost just by storing it for a few weeks and then reusing it. The same thing was true for the hardware. When we stripped the hardware of its paint, we found it was all bronze. By carefully cleaning it again, it became new hardware. With rekeying, we had excellent hardware again of a quality that would be hard pressed to come to again, even in a new hotel. So the rooms were complete. The lobbies were complete. The ironwork was complete. The restoration really came to an end. Now, as I said, about 80% of the original materials remained in the building, with about 20% having been lost over the three major renovations that had occurred, one in the 1930s, one in the late 40s, and then one in the 50s. This $25 million project won several restoration awards for what we called preservation, inventiveness, and creativeness. But and this is the key. It must be noted that in the long run, the hotel, this hotel, was a failure. Because of market condition, it just closed about four weeks ago. It had lost money for the last five years. And in fact, they're looking to renovate it again. It's going to go extensive restoration and renovation again. and market forces again will be the determinant of will it survive or will it not survive. So even if you do a good restoration to a building, it's no guarantee that the building will survive. Well, let's go on to the next project. Oh, that's right, it was a tax incentive project we mentioned. 
The next project is the National Gallery of Art. You may know it in Washington. This case study involves a absolutely pure intervention. The addition, that is the insertion, of an element that absolutely never existed in the mind of the architect originally or ever in the building. It was never contemplated in the original design. The building that you see is the National Gallery of Art, designed in 1941 by the great American architect and classicist John Russell Pope. The building was one of the very last of the great Beaux-Arts buildings in America designed in this monumental classical style. The building is filled with wonderful galleries, and believe it or not, it's not even on the National Register of Historic Places. And the reason is because it's so new. It's not yet 50 years old. It's an extraordinary art museum with excellent grand public spaces and entrances, spacious galleries filled with a prime quality of natural light for looking at paintings. And this wonderful natural light is a key to the success of this gallery. Well, if we take a look at some of the major galleries that exist, these are some new ones, by the way, that we designed only and opened only about three weeks ago. 16th and 17th century galleries. We're going to talk about a space which is directly above that great rotunda space in plan. Directly to the north of that space is a little lobby which is called the North Foyer. From this side, where the steps are, that's the Great Mall in Washington. And anybody who goes to the National Gallery from the Mall side easily finds their way up the Grand Stair and on to the main floor where all the great pictures are showing. If somebody comes from behind, on the other side, the automobile entrance, they enter the space directly under that North Lobby, and they enter this space, which is called the North Foyer, on the lower level. And most people who entered this space never went upstairs. They would tour the first floor of the gallery, and once having done that, they had no idea that the main gallery space was one floor above. So those people got short shrift. They never got to see most of the great American uh, gallery of the National Gallery. So our job was to cut a hole into that ceiling space to open up a view, as you might see here, for example, into the great rotunda space above. And by making that view attractive enough, excite people to find their way up to something that was intriguing above. Now, we tried cutting holes, and this is a model that we made to test different ideas about how the opening, which we finally termed the oculus, would look. So we tried a square opening like this. If you look at the north lobby and look down, we would be cutting a hole in that floor looking down. And here's the way the square opening might look in model form again. We tried round openings. We tried them with glass walls. We tried triangular openings. We tried hexagonal openings. We tried a variety of openings to see how the best design insertion would fit into this building. A lot of people were in favor of the glass rail, a modern solution, they said, something that was almost invisible, but seemed to go with the character of the space. So this was the runner-up. What we did decide to do was something similar, but much more in keeping with the original building. We cut a hole in that ceiling, and this is not the model any longer. This is the real photograph. We cut the opening which we call the oculus, and rimmed it with a parapet of marble in very much the same design and detailing as the original construction. Again, by doing careful research on the building, we were able to find out exactly in which quarry this marble was quarried. And was that quarry still open? The answer was yes. We were lucky to find it was still open. It was still quarrying the exact same marble as was quarried in 1941. And we were able to get exactly the same matched marble, matching all the other marbles in the building. The thing that we had to do 
was to cut out this entire floor in order to put in the new oculus. Every piece of finished material on this floor was numbered and carefully removed. And the reason was that this mosaic border was too difficult to remake again, and it was beautifully made in Italy originally, so he wanted to keep it. This material, which is the block marble on the main floor, matched all the other material in the main rotunda. And that material was no longer available anywhere. So all of this material had to be saved and reused for our work, or it could never match. So carefully, each piece was removed. And you can see each piece was numbered. Each piece was located exactly where it came from, so that it all could be replaced once again. And then each major block, which was originally in a square piece, was cut, the most minimal cut we could make, to make a new pattern, which was radial. And we knew we had eight extra pieces in case something happened. We found that we needed almost all of them. By the time we were done, we lost four and had only as an extra four extra pieces to finish our work. Can you imagine what would happen if we had gone out and broken eight or nine and had one major splotch which didn't match? And here is the new radial pattern that was cut in. All of the material you see on the main floor was existing material that was recut and remade to form the new uh, pattern. We matched every shipment of marble that came in was matched for texture, for grain, for color and figure, to make sure that every portion uh, matched uh, for every portion of the uh, new construction. Here it is again. As the uh, rotunda area, uh, I'm sorry, as the oculus area became uh, visual, visible again, all these pieces were added, carefully fitted together, with large segments in radial patterns cut and then placed here to make the uh, major oculus parapet wall. And here you can see how it all goes together, the oculus coming about. And then the view above, now that it's open, the view on site at the top level. What we felt was the most important view was one that was up. But the most popular view ever, now, ever since it's been open has been the view down, watching people go in and out of the Constitution Avenue entrance. This intervention that we talk about at the National Gallery of the Classical West Building. By carefully understanding Pope's work, by studying all his other monuments in the vicinity, in detail, by the way, we developed a new concept that related well to the existing building and still solved the problem. Indeed, we recognized early that our intervention would cause the loss of some basic original building fabric. But we concluded that we would reuse whatever materials we could and we would protect all new materials and take those and match them to the existing materials whenever possible, thus preserving the original character of the museum building, a character that was important to the history of the building. Well, from Atlantic City, where Lucy the Margate Elephant stands completely restored on the Atlantic City beaches, all the way to the Pacific where the cable cars ride up and down San Francisco's hills, the preservation movement is really moving forward and is being carried out in every town and every city in between. The preservation of historic buildings is clearly a compromise at best. We all know it and we really should recognize the point. Even in museum quality restorations, New museums, are, new materials are often substituted for worn out materials and new technical systems are always inserted to meet current standards of safety and comfort. New functional requirements must be met. As in the National Gallery, interventions into important buildings go on 
whether they are major, as in the oculus, or whether they are innocuous, as the insertion of a new electrical service for the staff's new coffee maker at Independence Hall. These types and changes and improvements will continue to be made in our historic buildings as long as our civilization grows and prospers. It is clearly our obligation and responsibility to treat our historic building heritage with care, understanding, knowledge, and most of all, with respect. As preservation architects, we are custodians of that heritage, and we must do our work ethically and with the highest standards possible so that history can be seen by all future generations. Thank you very much. I'm sure that I would be more than happy to ask. That's an interesting subject because in 1910, the hotel was so successful that it built an entire new addition in the rear, up 20 stories, adding some 300 rooms, and completely enclosed the roof garden to a series of enclosed meeting rooms, the center of which is the largest of the meeting rooms, became known as the Rose Garden and still bears that name. And the Rose Garden is the only remnant, the name itself is the only remnant of that beautiful garden that was used for promenading in the in 1904 building. So we didn't get to save that portion. Just how far do you go? Man is always changing, and that's part of his history. A lot of buildings, um, uh, for instance, the Victorian house, when they started as a Jewish revival, how, uh, how far do you go to preserve the history? The answer is it depends on each building. Sometimes it doesn't pay to restore it all. Every change is part of history, as you note. And every change is important. Some buildings have very little change. And the changes that were made to that building are not important at all. So you make a judgment after careful evaluation, analysis, documentation, and you set your limits on what should be done. Is it subjective? Absolutely. And the only way to make that subjective judgment of any value whatsoever is to do your homework. Find out if the changes are valuable. And if they are, don't touch them. The 1910 change that we just mentioned was so valuable to that building. It was such an important change that we decided that we could not restore it to exactly 1904 because we had this whole addition, which was 1910. So that was to remain. In the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, we changed the building back to its 1876 appearance, except in one room. It happened to be the entrance hall. Because in 1900, that room was changed so considerably and done so well with such care that that became an important item to restore in itself. So the answer is, it's a subjective thing, but do your homework and make your subjective sub. Uh, decision subject to scrutiny by doing that homework and making it on evidence and on analysis. So there's no stock answer. You know, just having an insertion like that, an intervention like that into the National Gallery, I spent probably three months thinking about it before I would even touch the project. When the director asked me to do it, I said that I didn't think it was wise. I didn't think we should do this to the John Russell Pope design. 
So it took me a long time after saying no to come back and say yes, I would do it. The answer is that the National Park Service has certain ideas. I often don't agree with them. Fortunately, in this case, I didn't have them to contend with from a standard point of view. But I have fought with them in other cases, and generally, they come around if you have enough evidence and enough reasoning to make it, them understand why you're doing it. Remember we talked about the why originally. You really have to identify why you're doing this and make it clear to other people and have all that evidence behind you because it's literally a matter of persuading people, whether it be the client or the National Park Service or your colleagues about what you're doing. I particularly choose this to talk about because after talking about reversibility as a standard, after talking about insertions as standards, I really try to show this because there are sometimes you come across cases which don't quite fit the book. Here is a non-reversible insertion. But we thought about it. We discussed it long and hard. Are such elements like this, new constructions, are they allowed in historic or significant buildings? When you really think about it long enough and you work at it long enough, sometimes you find it shouldn't be done and you have to back away. Sometimes like this we find it should be done and after careful consideration we begin to do it. But at least you take the time to carefully consider the alternatives and the options and all the difficult questions. This was many sleepless nights. Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Talking to many colleagues about it. So they are not easy answers. And they are all compromises at best. You just want to make them the best compromises possible. I watched people for about two hours when it first opened up. People came in, looked up, and they began to ask people, what's up there? How do I get up there? It seemed to answer the question. The functional need was met. And when they get up, they look immediately down to find out where they came from. It's very interesting. So they get to know that there are two levels now where before they never had a chance to know. which they do use. So I think it was a bonus. They became interested in the relationship of these two spaces. And people have uh, thought that it, it has been a good thing for the gallery, a good thing for the visitor. Interesting idea. Uh, there are other types of openings like that in the history of building. We studied many of them. Uh, this one works particularly well because there's a view, in fact, ahead of you as you come in, which is a little different. It's kind of Pyrenaean, people have said. So we think it worked out pretty well. Yes, the gallery has done that, and they have agreed that it's clearly met the requirement of the function it was supposed to serve. And that many more people will now go upstairs as well as downstairs, and so there's a significant majority of people now making that transition. That's been a very positive influence in the gallery. So in one case, you could say by headcount, it solved the functional problem. But it really had to do more than that, and that's why we spent so much time on it. The answer is no. I think people 
understand the perspective when they see it. And I think it's something that makes them go up and take a look at what is happening up there. Absolutely unresolved when you see it, what does happen. It's part of the draw to make you go up and take a look. Also, I think that for a change, people get to see the column capitals, which they never get to see in the main space above. When you're in this huge space of the main rotunda of the gallery, and you try to look up at the capitals, you never get a chance to see them. So this gave us a new view, which we never had before. By the way, those, cap those columns that you saw there, those big columns in the uh, rotunda area, are all solid marble. They're all absolutely solid pieces of marble stacked up one on top of each other and then capped with a capital. One of the few instances in monumental architecture in America where that happens to be the case. Okay, well thank you very much.